Hello, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Welcome to week three of uh, Canadian Whiskey Certification. Just like always, I am jo joined by Ricky, Gina, and Dave. Um, we are going to be talking through maturation and flavor today with our 100 students um, and anyone else that's joining us. Um, before we get to that, though, just a reminder, we're here on Facebook, or you may be watching us on YouTube. If you haven't already, like and subscribe. Um, we do this over the next, uh, I guess, today, and then, of course, one more session. It's a four-week program. Um, so we're taking off next week, but then we'll be back the following week uh, with our last class. But we have a ton of uh, previous classes that you can go watch. Um, so again, if you haven't already, like, subscribe, poke around. There's a lot to learn um, and there's a lot still to learn. So, uh, and I wanted to make sure everyone knows, just like always, Ricky is here with us. Um, he will be translating the whole program into Spanish for some of our Spanish speaking students and anyone joining us that's Spanish speaking or prefers that. Um, just pop your comments, questions in the chat, just like you would normally, and then Ricky will get those translated and back to you. Um, so thank you, Ricky, for all of your service. We appreciate that. Um, I'm going to toss it over to Dave and Gina to talk through this week's lesson, which again is maturation and flavor. Amazing. Thanks, Liz. And yeah. thanks, Ricky. Uh, welcome back, everybody. I'm assuming everyone's here. We haven't lost anyone yet. Have you heard, Professor? No one, no one's... <laughs> We're not scared we lost a couple. Way. We lost a couple, but we we always lose a couple. I'm scary, Dave. I'm scary. Well, to all of you watching, look how strong you are. Look, look at you. Give yourself a <laughs> give yourself a pat on the back. Uh, we're almost there. We're in week three, as Liz said. Flavor maturation. We're gonna have a little bit of fun today. I'm gonna pass it over to Gina, but make sure when I come back, you've got. Wait, how do I work this? Your 18-year-old, J.P. Weiser's 18-year-old, and your Pike Creek, because we'll be tasting those later. And on that note, take it away, Professor. Okie dokie. So before I get started, a couple of things I just want to touch on. Uh, like Liz said, next week we do not uh, have class. It is Valentine's Day, and we know that... Most of you are bartenders and you will be crazy busy setting up your bars and going into service. And we certainly don't want to take away from that. So we're going to skip next week. Just gives you more time to study, read, rewatch recordings, whatnot. Uh, and then we'll be back the following week. So don't miss us for week four. Also, just to touch back on last week's uh, Wednesday session, you all may remember me playing a video and me just kind of sitting there like this most of the time because I could hear the fun music playing in the background. But we had some technical issues and I did not realize that no one else could hear the sound. So I apologize for that. That had to be incredibly awkward for everyone to sit through three minutes of silence. Um, but there were some fun facts about the distillery up and for our certification students, I did post the uh, video with sound, and Liz also sent it uh, in the box folder. So you do have that, um, but my apologies for any awkwardness last week uh, in our session. Okay, on to maturation. Here we go. So first, we're going to look at the warehouses. Uh, like last week, we're looking, you know, all of our video footage, all of our photography is, of course, at the Hiram Walker Distillery because that's where all these whiskeys that we're tasting are made. And it is a massive facility, so there's lots to show you within it. So let's take a look at the Pike Creek warehouses. Now, these are called the Pike Creek warehouses because they sit next to a little creek called Pike Creek. It's about 20 minutes uh, from the distillery, but it actually, we don't get our water source from that creek. We've named the warehouses that because it sits next to the creek. So this is where uh, all of our whiskeys age. There are 16 warehouses 
and they are holding over 1.6 million barrels. Now, these, uh, these barrels are stacked six high on pallets, as you can see there, and we've got 600 barrels per row. Now, we do not temperature control. You see all that rust on those barrel rings uh, or those barrel rungs? That's because we do not temperature control our warehouses, okay? And with this drastic temperature fluctuation that we're going to talk about a little bit later, what happens in our warehouses is we've got, you know, the climate there in Windsor is very hot and humid in the summertime, like Louisville. And we're sitting on the Great Lakes, humidity, okay? But super cold in the wintertime. We've gotten down to negative 40. That's in Celsius and Fahrenheit. So what happens, temperature fluctuations, we're seeing a lot of condensation happening on the outside of our barrels, okay? And you can see that right there on those rings. We're going to talk about what happens on the inside of those barrels later on. Certainly not rust. Okay, so let's touch back on the regulations. So the regulations of maturation, we covered this in week one. But now we're going to dive a little deeper. It says it must be aged in small wood for not less than three years. Well, what does that mean, small wood? Less than or equal to not more than 700 liters in volume, okay? Now, here's some illustrations of some casks, some barrels, um, just to kind of give you, you know, an idea of size in comparison to one another, okay? At Hiram Walker, we're really aging everything in 250 or 225 liter barrels. Everything's sitting in that size barrels. And, you know, most of the whiskey produced is being aged in around that size of barrel. You know, you're going to see some bigger, uh, some smaller when you see especially like smaller batches of things being produced at distilleries, um, maybe smaller distilleries that don't have the space or the output um, for larger barrels. So they're using smaller barrels and that's okay. Um, but they're going to do different things. But what we're using is about 250 to 225 liter barrels. A 700 liter barrel is quite large. Wood is expensive. You know, we're not really going to get the wood influence from those barrels that we would like using that big of a barrel because there's just not as much a surface contact from that. Now, we can use any type of wood in Canada to mature our whiskey. So just to give you some examples of what's aging at Hiram Walker, and this is certainly not an exhaustive list, um, but new white oak, American oak, once used bourbon casks, giving us those dried fruit notes, multiple use Canadian whiskey barrels, ones that come in as bourbon barrels, and then we use them over and over and over and over and over. These are our three main ones, but we've got a lot of other types of wood aging uh, in the warehouse, aging our whiskeys. We've got rum barrels, Hungarian oak, red oak. We've got some Speyside single malt casks, uh, tequila barrels, French oak, Oloroso, uh, Pedro Jimenez, Madeira casks, port, red wine casks heated quarter casks, black sea casks, seasoned oak. We've got inserts we can put in there. There's cherry uh, barrels sitting in there. There's all kinds of stuff. Like I said, this is not an exhaustive list, but it just gives you an idea of the possibilities, right? Of all those different flavors that can de be developed, putting one style of whiskey in many different types of wood. You're developing different woods different flavor components coming out in those whiskeys. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about dilution. So remember, coming out of the stills, that single column still we talked about last week, we're coming out around 70% ABV. Double column distillation, going through that second column, 
we're going to bring that up to about 94, 95 ABV. And then from the column into the pot, we're now bringing that 70% up to about 80% ABV. But going into the barrel, we're going to dilute it down. So 58%. Uh, for the single column and the column and pot distillations and the double column, the very light styled whiskeys are going to go into the barrel at 76% ABV. Now, this is what we call drain and fill. And this video is going at about, I don't know, 100 times faster than it actually goes. I have it going in fast forward here. These barrels roll off the truck. Okay. On this conveyor belt, they are separated out, and then they're going to roll down this conveyor belt. And what's going to happen is the bungs are going to come out, a hose is going to go in the top, basically suck it out, drain the barrel, suck it out like a vacuum. It's going to keep going down the line. A different hose is going to go in, and it will be filled with new whiskey, and then it will go onto another conveyor belt right back on to a different truck out to the warehouse okay so it happens this is how Hiram Walker is able to take out drain uh about 1100 to 1300 bottles or sorry barrels a day uh and then also fill and put back into the warehouse 1100 to 1300 barrels a day and that is how we have so much capacity. Now, there are humans working in that room. Uh, if you looked closely in that video, you could see someone moving kind of quickly in the background uh, because, you know, these machines aren't aren't foolproof. Uh, things happen. You have to adjust things. Tops don't come off right every once in a while. But it does increase the capacity of what we're able to do at the distillery. So let's look at barrel influence. What is the wood doing? Let's first look at charring. So we char a barrel, we're putting this giant flame through it when the barrel is made. And that's, that's creating this carbon layer on the inside of the barrel, okay? That's doing two things. It's a layer of carbon. So one is removing sulfur. It's, it's kind of like a layer of, like a Brita filter, okay? You put your water through a Brita filter and it's filtering out all kinds of things, okay? One of those things can be sulfur. The char on the inside of a barrel is going to remove sulfur. So when you're determining how deep of a char you need, Lots of different things go into that determination. However, one of the things is what we talked about last week. Style of distillation, your still. How much copper is in your still to remove sulfur out of the whiskey? That sulfur was created from the yeast. We've got to deal with it, okay? Uh, or do we not have a lot of copper in our distillation and we need more sulfur removal through maturation. We're going to want a deeper char then. So do we need a number four char, which is pretty deep? Or do we need, you know, not much at all, something in between? There's lots of different char levels, toasting barrels that are going to bring out different uh, wood extracts, but also remove uh, components as well. The other thing that that charring does is going to help add wood extract, okay? So by charring the barrel, by flaming it, right, on the inside, we are going to degrade the, the, the makeup, the plant fibers that make up this wood, which are cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. That's, that's the makeup of plants, okay? So when we degrade those, when we break them apart with this fire, we're now allowing these wood extracts to come to life, okay? Things like vanillin, right? The, the coconut notes. And we're going to develop oak lactones, and that's where those coconut notes are going to come from as well. So charring can remove things like sulfur, but also add flavor depending on how deep a char you have and, and how many wood extracts you're going to get from it. Um, so there, there's different 
uh, roles that charring can play from a barrel. Now, this chart is actually a chart created by our master blender, Dr. Don Livermore. This was part of his PhD. And what he was studying was how much wood extract. So he's not really looking at what's being removed, but he's looking at what's being added into the whiskey from different depths of char. And you see that red line there. That's our highest wood extract. Okay, that's a two millimeter depth or a number two char level of wood. And he realized that, you know, over this study, which looks like a little over 1100 days, um, he realized that you're going to get the most wood extract from a number two char level barrel versus a number four char level, which I would have assumed before learning this from him. I would have gotten more wood extract from a number four. We burned more, we degraded more cellulose, but you can actually go too far, okay, for adding things to the whiskey for that specific cause. Now, you still get a good amount of wood extract from a four millimeter depth, that number four char level. That's the green line there. Um, you can also see the American bourbon barrels, a little bit of wood extract, but certainly not nearly as much, right? And then as you use them over and over and over, you're going to get less and less over time. What's really unique here is that first 200 days. You see from zero to 200 on that bottom line, that wood extract line on all four of these lines is where it goes up the most right? The most dramatic incline. That's where you're getting the most from your barrels. The most flavor is being imparted into your whiskey in the first 200 days. And it will certainly increase from there, you know, a little bit, but not as much as those first 200 days. So let's look at these components. Cellulose is kind of like the bricks of a brick wall, okay? They're big, they're like 10,000 dextrose units, they're giant. They make up most of the wood, okay? 40 to 50% is cellulose. These are big, giant uh, compounds. Then you have hemicellulose. Think of these like the loose bricks on a brick wall. These are much, much smaller, only like 200 units long, and about 15 to 20% of the wood is gonna be made up of the hemicellulose. And then the lignin kind of acts like the mortar, holding it all together, okay? And this is about 10 to 20% of the wood makeup. Um, but breaking down the lignin is where you're going to come up with like spice notes and different, different compounds, um, smoky notes, depending on which plant we're talking about specifically. Lots of different flavors that can be derived from uh, breaking down these compounds like caramel, toffee, uh, I talked about spice and smoke, leather notes, and many, many more. Now, other influences that the barrel has or the wood has on the whiskey would be things like tannins. These are odorless. So when you're nosing a whiskey, you can't smell a tannin, okay? But when you when you start to taste the whiskey, there is a mouthfeel to it. it. It has a bitterness. It's tea-like. It's it's very chalky and astringent on my gums is how I, you know, really can pick up tannin. Um, you know, I really feel it on my gums. I feel some people say the sides of their tongues. Um, for me, like I said, it's it's on my gums, but it's very astringent, a little bit bitter as well. Oak lactones, I touched on this. These develop, right, through charring, uh, the breaking down of that wood. Now these oak lactones are coming to life. And this is where we get our coconut notes. Now there's also things called translactones. And depending on your ratio of oak lactones or translactones, uh, depends on what kind of flavor you're really getting out of there more. So French oak is kind of a one-to-one -one ratio. We're going to get more vanilla notes. Whereas in American oak, 
we'll, we'll have more oak lactones in that ratio, less trans lactones, and, and actually coconut will come forward a little bit more from those barrels. And then also the barrel is, of course, giving the whiskey color. Okay, so it goes in the barrel clear, our whiskey does. And then depending on the length of time we're spending in that barrel, what type of wood it is, uh, is it a new barrel? Has it been used multiple times? That's going to depend on how much color the barrel is going to give the whiskey as well. Diffusion. So diffusion is really the scientific term for barrel finishing. We all talk about barrel finished whiskeys, finished in this cask, finished in that cask. The scientific uh, term for it is diffusion. And what's happening is you have this barrel and you have the previous liquid that was in it. I'm going to say port just for an example, okay? So let's say we have a port cask here. And all those little green dots represent the molecules of port, okay? Now they're all in the wood. Then we pour our whiskey into this barrel. What's happening is not all of those green little port molecules are coming into our whiskey. They're coming to equilibrium. So they're gonna distribute themselves equally in the spaces that they can exist, okay? So they're gonna, they're gonna distribute themselves equally amongst the wood and the whiskey, okay? Some flavors we're gonna get from, from some common finishing barrels would be walnuts, raisins, dates from sherry barrels. Uh, Oloroso sh uh, sherry barrels are gonna give us more like marmalade, um, like holiday pudding. Get some fruity and spicy and chocolatey notes from pork casks. Wine is obviously going to depend on the wine. What type of wine? There's so many different types of wine, right? Uh, rum. We tend to get more island spices, brown sugar notes into our whiskey. Uh, cognac is going to give us more almond nuttiness, some dried fruits. And bourbon casks that we use quite often at Hiram Walker uh, are going to give us more dried fruit notes, that caramel, that vanilla. Now, when we look at, at this chart again from Dr. Don, we see that that first 200 days is also really important here. All of the diffusion, okay, all of that equilibrium happening, or those molecules coming to equilibrium, that's all happening in the first 200 days. After that, you are not getting any more port into your whiskey. It will continue to age. And so you're going to get aging effects on your whiskey. Um, as you age, you know, there's angel share. So there's evaporation loss, right? The alcohol is evaporating out around 3% a year. Um, at Hiram Walker, at least that's going to be different depending where you where your distillery or your warehouses are and your terroir. But um, you know, because of Angel Share, because of that evaporation, you might get more concentrated flavors through time, depending how long they're finished uh, sitting in those finishing barrels. So it really depends what you're going for. But you're certainly not getting any more of that previous liquid into your whiskey. And finally, uh, terroir. Now, this is a highly debatable topic in the whiskey industry. You know, everyone has an opinion on it, and a lot of people have different opinions and different reasons for them. Ours is that terroir of your warehouses is very important. It certainly affects your whiskey when you do not temperature control your warehouses. So in Windsor, at Pike Creek, like I said earlier, we have these drastic temperature fluctuations, right? And what's happening when you have really humid and really cold and dry and really humid and hot and really cold and dry, your barrels are expanding and contracting through time. And a little bit of oxygen is getting in there. They're sort of breathing. But when oxygen 
interacts with alcohol, it sets off a series of chain reactions, chain like chemical reactions, and they happen very, very quickly, okay? But what happens at the end of that chemical reaction, one of the things that uh, comes to life is ethyl acetate, okay? Now, <clears throat> I'm gonna tell you why that's important in a second, but if we look at this graph, of ethyl acetate. This is a double column distilled corn whiskey. Very light in style, uh, purposely matured in multiple use Canadian whiskey barrels. So it's not going to get, it doesn't have a lot of grain or yeast character, and it's not going to get a lot of wood character uh, or wood extracts through time, right? But what it is doing is developing ethyl acetate. And you see that line going up through time. What is ethyl acetate? Green apple, it's a bright green apple note. Okay, there's other descriptors, but we really find like a bright green apple note um, properly identifies it in our whiskeys to us. Um, if you look at that 18 year mark, Dave's going to taste you in a little bit on J.P. Weiser's 18, but that's the ethyl acetate of J.P. Weiser's 18 right there, okay? And so it's going to make so much sense. Now, that line is going to differ depending where your warehouses are. You know, this is the terroir part of, of whiskey. If you're in Scotland and you have more temperate climates, your barrels aren't breathing as much. So that, that line's going to be lower. Ethyl acetate's gonna gonna form, but not as much through time. And also, depending on what style of scotch it is, if there's peat, that could be covering up uh, ethyl acetate development, you know, uh, some other flavor notes. Now, if we look at Texas, a Texas bourbon, maybe, that's gonna have a higher line. Okay, more ethyl acetate. But remember, if we're talking about a bourbon, it's a very grain forward. The yeast is affecting the flavor a lot. Okay, big, bold flavor from distillation already. Going into brand new oak, getting, go, getting a lot of wood extract there, right? So lots of things there that could be also covering up some of that ethyl acetate. So there's different reasons why you may or may not taste it or taste it at different levels, but the development of this uh, chemical compound is there and it's very dependent on that oxygen reacting with the whiskey. So depending on how much your barrels are gonna breathe and how much oxygen is gonna um, react with the whiskey or come in contact with the alcohol, is gonna depend on how much ethyl acetate develops over time. Okay, that said, I think it is the perfect time, Dave Mitten, for you to taste on to taste us through some JP Weiser's 18. Hold your horses there, Professor. We have some questions uh, for you. Okay. Now looking at them, I'm like, they're all going to be answered by the one and only Dr. Don Livermore tomorrow, but why don't I throw a few at you right now while you're in the mood? Okay. Uh, right. price, with the barrels you use, is there a char standard you have to use or prefer for your whiskey? Mm. Well, we don't have to use any specific char level in Canada. Um, so it's kind of up to the master blender and the maturation team uh, working with Amy, who, you, who our students met last week in their uh, expert workshop. But her and her team, the, them all working together of what they want the end product to be and how things are going to react with one another to get there, right? I will say most commonly at Hiram Walker, we are going to be using, if it's a new barrel, we're going to be bringing in a number two char level. And that honestly is because all of our stills, like you saw last week, are 100% copper. Okay, so we're removing a lot of sulfur and we can really go for a lot of wood extract and control how much through the length of time we leave it in the barrel. Okay, however, we're also bringing in 
a lot of bourbon barrels or bourbon casks, right? So um, those are coming in at number four char levels, but they have been used already uh, for bourbon. So that's most common at Hiram Walker, uh, but there is no regulation saying what char level you need to do in Canada. Now, the next one, you've kind of, you might have answered it, but Megan's asked. Uh, and Don, we can ask him if he knows the exact answer tomorrow. And Megan wants to know what the ratio of new barrels to use barrels used in Canadian whiskey, probably dependent on each distillery, as she's asking, which very mm-hmm. much so in the sense that we have 1.6 million barrels laying down. Uh, I could say the majority of them are X bourbon casks, same as Scotland and Ireland's. Yeah. Yeah, but like you said, it's very dependent on the distillery, what style of whiskey is being made, you know. Um, But I would say for our students, tomorrow, let's ask Don. He might not even know off the top of his head, but he definitely has the ability to find out right now in the Pike Creek warehouses what is the ratio of new to used barrels aging um next one is one we will we will ask dawn this tomorrow just to i always like to get updated on this stuff but how often is a barrel recharged gina mentioned that the barrels Mm -hmm. were filled directly on the line after emptying i think i'm missing something ah missing is no 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 uh We don't rechar them often, Um, but we do have some rye whiskey uh, aging and maybe some others. We'll we'll ask Don tomorrow, but we definitely have some rye whiskey that is aging in recharred barrels. And so when you rechar a barrel or have them recharred, um, what you're doing is you're kind of reigniting at a little bit of a deeper level some more wood extracts. You feel like "Mm, you could get a little bit more out of this if you need to. Um, But that's a question I think for Don tomorrow as well to go a little bit more in detail. We don't do it a ton, to be honest. Now, Marianne has a very good question. And I know Don's going to tackle this tomorrow because he's put some whiskeys out recently with with this method. It was mentioned in week one that can Canadian whiskey can use any type of wood. What are the other types of wood that are used? Gene obviously went through quite a few. Is it just different style oak barrels? Obviously, some woods are weaker. So that said, can you put birch, cedar, maple, staves mm-hmm. in the barrel? Which the answer is yes. And you might even see a JP Weiser's coming out in the next couple months with something like that happening in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can definitely put staves in the barrel. Um, It has to be in a wooden barrel first or cask. um, But you can add staves to add different flavor components for sure. And yes, some types of wood are weaker. That doesn't mean you can't do it. It's just going to be more expensive. You're going to have more leakage, you know, breakdown of those uh, barrels. Uh, There's a... There's a two more. There's a few in Spanish that R- R- Ricky's going to get to. Uh, one, I do love this. Jasmine wants to know, when do we know to retire a barrel? And the <laughs> honest answer, Don will tell you tomorrow, when that barrel breaks and falls apart is usually when that barrel is retired and someone from the distillery will take the wood and, and make furniture out of it. They will use the barrels until they fall apart. And he'll get into that tomorrow quite in depth. Mm-hmm. Um, last, but certainly not least. Oh, does Hiram Walker, wait. Uh, does Hiram Walker have its own cooperage? Do you make your own barrels? It is the only thing we don't have there. We do not have a cooperage. It'd be pretty cool no. if we did, but we don't. We buy mm-hmm. all of our barrels from a third party importer up from the US and overseas. Yeah. A, a few different um, companies that are supply us with barrels. One of them is Kelvin Cooperage, but there, there's a few different ones that we use. 
certainly. I know there is one uh, question I want to get to. I don't see them all, but uh, about two millimeters versus four millimeters of depth, just to go over that one more time, what that means. So when you're charring, you're, you know, you're making this char level or this char layer, I should say, on the inside of the wood. And so it's really how deep you're charring into that piece of wood, okay, into that stave. Two millimeters deep, four millimeters deep, you know, and that's kind of, that's how it's measured, okay, the different char levels. So, all right, I'm ready for whiskey. All right, I hope everyone else is. Um, oh, somebody wants to send us some staves for hot sauce. I'm into that. Let's make that happen, Tina. <laughs> I love that um, stuff. All right, first up, we're going to do the J.P. Weiser's 18-year-old, which we've already had. But we're going to do it again because it's so lovely. Now, if you remember, this is our 100% corn whiskey, double column distilled, uh, aged in ex-Canadian whiskey casks. The ones, yes, that we'll use over and over until they fall apart. Uh, 40 ABV, 80 proof. Looking at this right now, the room I'm in is a little dark, but it is a very lovely, light autumn amber, as a brand team would tell you. The red layer. Okay, love this. Um, now on the nose, being that Canadian whiskey cast used over and over, you don't get as much like big warming vanilla, sweet toffee caramel you would from new oak. But I mean, I get lots of mature oak on this. Kind of get autumn florals. I get a little hint of pine. Uh, but yeah, lots of the oak coming off it. You almost, in my mind, I mean, I get the sweet richness of the corn whiskey. First sip. This is, I've said it before, it's our softest, perhaps lightest whiskey we have in the portfolio. Really easy to sip on, but it's got a great mouthfeel. Tasting's real good today. Okay. I like that. And then, you know, <laughs> it's got a great mouthfeel, plentiful. You get the mature oak. It's, somebody said baked apples once, so I always get that. But it's um, kind of like that green apple Gina was talking about with the apple acetate. It's almost like green apple dipped in caramel. Like you would, you'd have at Halloween. Um, and I get a lot of the spice. Like I feel that heat. Even though it's a light styled whiskey, it's like you get the spice off the, as they were once ex bourbon cast turned into Canadian whiskey cast, you still kind of get that spice flavor coming from it. Mm -hmm. Now, this one, yeah, somebody, Camp Runamuck just said, uh, Liz said, drop your tasting notes. Tell me what you get. Toffee apple? Absolutely. Caramel apple? Mm hmm. And I mean, this one, I just love it on its own. Uh, I was telling the story. One of our, one of the people that sells this over in Germany, he was tell, uh, selling our whiskeys in Germany. He told me that he keeps a bottle of the JP Weiser's 18 hidden in his backyard. So when he goes out for a end of the evening cheeky cigarette, he always pours himself a little whiskey. He said it's his nightcap at the end of the night. I kind of like that. Mint. I like the mint. Mm -hmm. Werther's green apple candy. Yeah. Butterscotch candy, 100%. There's no wrong answer. This is. Somebody said it was tasting good today. It really is. I agree. I mean, there's a... Where I'm sitting, there's a party across the hall. The Lunar, Lunar New Year. Happy Lunar New Year. Uh, which I'll probably be attending afterwards. <laughs> Golden Grams. I like that. Bring it, bring your whiskey. Yeah, okay. So I wanna Amy was just saying she found a bottle at Total Wine that was $53.99, which is pretty surprising for that age. That's a great segue to just talk about the whiskey for a minute. Because we get that all the time from people. And sometimes it's almost I don't want to say damaging, but we've had people say, what's wrong with it? 
why is your 18 year old whiskey under $60? Because most 18 year old whiskeys you're going to find are going to be close to $200 a bottle. Simply put, we've got 1.6 million barrels of this laying down. We don't need to charge $200 a bottle. So it is a very fair price, but, and where if you're putting this on a menu, whiskey menu at your bar or restaurant, you can charge a little bit more for it because it's worth it and have a pretty good costing on it. Mm -hmm. Shall we move on, Gina Fawcett? Uh, yes, I think this is a good segue. There's a question about um, Canadian whiskey being, if it's aged ever in multiple or different barrels, like one whiskey in multiple barrels. Mm -hmm. So I think you should uh, lead us into that. Oh, yes. Wonderful. What a what a great way to start this one. Um, you're all familiar with the Pike Creek? This is our first time trying this in the class, isn't it? Very nice. Okay. So Pike Creek, obviously the name of Pike Creek comes from the part of town where our 16 warehouses that house those 1.6 million barrels are from. There is a tiny little creek next to it that is called Pike Creek. It is not where the water comes from, where we make our whiskey. That is the Great Lakes of Ontario, the St. Lawrence. Um, now, Pike Creek starts off in a very traditional manner for Canadian whiskey. It is a majority of that soft double column distilled corn, aged in ex-bourbon cast we bring up from the U.S. It is a tiny amount, under 5% of that once column distilled rye that is aged in the ex-bourbon casks. Now, both of those distillates are aged for 10 years in the ex-bourbon casks. And once we're done, I know you were all paying attention when Gina was talking about the barrel finishing and the diffusion. For this particular expression of whiskey, we put the finished whiskey out of the bourbon casks into Demerara rum barrels for 200 days. Because as Gina was telling you, you're not going to get much more out of the barrels as far as flavor extracting from what was in the barrel before, hence this being rum. And you have got this beautiful copper colored, look how copper that is. Whiskey, I mean, yeah. right away, I always get like raisins. Raisins on the nose, lots of brown sugar. People will always say, and, and jump in and start telling me what you're getting. Um, a lot of people say maple because Canada. Uh, it is a pretty color. Jasmine's on fire today. Um, <laughs> I get a little bit of like candied orange almost. A uh, little bit of that apple. It's 10 year. You get a little of that green apple, but I do get vanilla on this one. Now, where the JP Weiser's 18 we had, where I say it's maybe the lightest whiskey we have, certainly smooth. This also is just as smooth. Very light, but it might be the sweetest whiskey we have. Doesn't that go down dangerously easy? So much brown sugar. And I get like sweet honey on this too. Uh, lots of island spices. Somebody said Christmas cake once, and that's stuck in my head where it's like a holiday cake. Just rich, mm -hmm. rich flavors. But mm -hmm. pralines, I like that. Mandarin, yep. Cinnamon. If you all remember Christina Vieira uh, in our first expert session with the bartenders, uh, she used Pike Creek in her cocktail, Daybreak and Trelawney. So it's something to reference uh, for inspiration if you're looking for cocktail inspiration with this. Um, it, lots of stuff. It's lots a good segue, Gina, because this is one that. Um, a lot of people like consumers buy this one up because again, it's a really great price for a 10 year old whiskey and is stunning on its own, but watching bartenders and I love when things happen naturally, whether you're in West coast, Canada, whether you're in Germany, like I was talking before UK, Southern part of the U S wherever you are and Pike Creek sold, we've noticed two things happen uh, in the summer months, the warmer months, the hotter parts of the world, bartenders are using this. They're muddling up herbs, fresh juices, filling 
uh, glasses with crushed ice and doing tropical style refreshing drinks like Christina's the other day with the blood orange over crushed ice. Um, and in the winter months, it also makes sense. They're doing coffee style cocktails. They're doing flips, dessert style cocktails, that soft sweetness. So it's uh, not always used in making your classic cocktails, but people get really inventive with this whiskey. And it's good for uh, cocktail costing. Price of it's not too expensive at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to hit a couple questions. So one is about the color of the whiskey. So if we don't reach our barrels, how are we dealing with the coloring of the whiskey? And this is definitely something that Don is going to talk about tomorrow and or next the next session because we have Don uh, in expert sessions twice, but he has a whole section on coloring. Um, but one thing, one thing is caramel coloring that we talked about in category regulations in week one, that we can add caramel coloring and it's a very little bit, um, but it, it makes the product a consistent color, you know, barrels age differently over time. Your, your weather, your climate is different. Your terroir is different. Uh, so it's going to look a little different sometimes. And uh, when it does, use a little caramel coloring. And you and I have done this both. I mean, for anyone watching, well, anyone on right now, I'll never forget from my ignorance uh, over a decade ago, the first time I went in and asked, and I kind of thought, oh, caramel coloring. And then you learn, you're like, it's caramel coloring, not caramel flavoring. We hear the word caramel and think that it's going to change the flavor of it. It does not. And then watching how little goes in, it is like a pin drop. Like you put more bitters in an old fashioned than you do droplets into a bottle of whiskey to make it a consistent color. Pretty wild. Um. Someone would like to know what a stave is. Dave, you want to explain a stave? I did mention staves earlier, and I never explained what that meant. A so stave or a date? A stave? I don't. As you can say, I don't think any. <laughs> I don't have any here. We're talking about the inserts either. into the. We're talking about the inserts into the barrels. Mm -hmm. Or the staves that make up the outside of the barrel. Yeah, I mean, a stave is you know. Uh, I think Monique's asking, like, a stave would be when you're looking at a barrel. Oh, wait. That's a stave to make up the barrels. But when we have barrels we're aging in, we'll put, uh, Dawn will have all the difference, like maple, somebody mentioned earlier, uh, wood or cherry wood that can go in it to extract flavors. Mm-hmm. There's a couple of these we're going to leave for Don, um, particularly different grains and maturation and how, you know, the interactions go choosing a barrel for a specific grain. Um, and, and there are a lot of components going into figuring out which barrel is going to be best for the whiskey you want to produce. I mean, they've got it down, you know, to a science. Uh, at this point, but um, we're going to let Don kind of take that one tomorrow for sure. Someone just asked that. if that was metal that wraps the barrel on this little guy. It is, and it is on the big barrels too. It's um, hence where Gina was showing you all the rust. So it's the metal mm -hmm. rungs that keep it all together. Yeah. And if okay. you ever, Sometimes you'll see barrels at bars or restaurants that they'll have as decoration or tables. Um, and unless it's adjusted, where I mean, Monique's on here now, and I know at her spot, Bar Reval, they've got really cool barrel tables. They're put together in a different way where if you just grab a barrel and the wood dries out, like if you let this sit here for too long, the, the wood will shrink up and it will fall apart and the ring, rungs will come off on a proper barrel. So you'll see that at some distilleries as well. Good point. 
Okay, I think that we've hit most of our questions. Uh, we've got a few for Dawn tomorrow. We are going to leave you a little early today um, because we've been cramming so much information in um, that we wanted to have a, a week with a little breathing room here. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us. But I think right now we can pass it back to Liz. She's awesome. ready for us. Yes. Um, like Gina said, thank you all for joining us. Don't forget, um, we are off next week. Um, that's for both the class and the workshop students that are watching. Um, if you're not a student, we will not be here next week. It is Valentine's Day, and we know this is the busiest day in this industry. So um, please enjoy. Try to stay sane. Um, and then we will rejoin you uh, the following week for our last class of this session. Um, like Gina also said, a lot of these questions that went unanswered today will, will be answered by Don tomorrow. So we've saved them. If he doesn't get to them at some point, we'll be sure to ask, um, but no question will go unanswered. Um, so we will see our students tomorrow for the workshop. The rest of you will see you in two weeks. Thank you all again. Bye. You. See you tomorrow.